All right, let's turn our hearts, continue, I should say, our hearts in worship as we look together at the Psalms. Psalm 68, 19, and 20. Read it with me, please. Praise be to the Lord, to God our Savior, who daily bears our burdens. Our God is a God who saves. From the sovereign Lord comes escape from death. Now stand and sing with me. This is my Father's world. This is my Father's to my listening ears. All nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my Father's world. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas. His hand the wonders wrought. This is my Father's world. The birds their carols raise. The morning light, the willy white, declare their Maker's praise. This is my Father's world. is my father's world oh let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems oft so strong god is the ruler yet this is my father's world why should my heart be sad the lord is king let the heavens ring, God reigns, let the earth be glad. You can be seated. No, you can stay standing, right? Oh, oh wait, no, there's a scripture being read, I'm sorry. <laughs> you can sit. <laughs> We're messed up today. Our scripture reading is from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 20 through 25. In the future... When your son asks you, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws the Lord our God has commanded you? Tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent miraculous signs and wonders, great and terrible, upon Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. But he brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land that he promised on oath to our forefathers. The Lord commanded us to obey all that we might always prosper and be kept alive, as is the case today. And if we are careful to obey all this law before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. I can stand again. <laughs> Um, this morning, we are focusing on um, our God as Father, and in this passage, too, later that you'll hear from Kevin, fathers teaching their children to obey the Lord. And the last line that we just read was talking about how God brings us to righteousness, obeying his commands and decrees. And we can trust that our Father is good when he gives those commands and decrees to us. They're hard sometimes, but that comes through understanding him through his word. This morning we're going to sing Goodness of God. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up. goodness of God and all my life 
and he has told us so many times in his word. Let's sing together how deep the Father's love for us.
standing for the reading of the gospel. The gospel reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 7 through 12. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks knocks. I'm sorry. He who seeks finds, and to him who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If then, though you are evil, know to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. You may be seated. Now it's time to take the offering. So if the men who are helping with that would come up. And as they're coming up, would you take one of the yellow pads? Actually, I don't know what color it is. One of the pads, yeah, yellow. And sign your name and pass it along. And if there's somebody in your row that you don't know, it's a great opportunity to sneak a glance and say hi to them after. All right, so let's pray. Lord, we offer you these gifts because you gave them to us in the first place. Lord, would you help us never to think of our money as our own or even our, our life as our own. Everything we are and have belongs to you and Lord, we give back to you with thankful hearts for your grace and for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. You take out your bulletins and look at the prayer page, prayer panel. We have a few people to pray for. And would you take this home and pray for these things during the week? And I want you to notice the, the line that says the spiritual growth of the church. Those prayer requests always come from our Friday morning prayer group. So we go through a passage of scripture. Uh, we've been going through the book of James. And we pray according to what the scriptures say for our church and for ourselves. And these prayer requests come out of that. And I would encourage you, if you're free on Friday mornings, 9 a.m., to come and join us over on the other side of the building every Friday. And we, we have a great time of prayer that day. Now let's pray. We, we have a great time of prayer that day. Now let's pray for these requests. Lord, we come to you as a needy people, would you hear our prayers? 
Lord, we're weak, we're sinful. We have so many things in our lives that we need you to intervene on. Lord, would you show us a sign of your goodness? Lord, I pray for Stephen and Lori. They're in need of you, and Lord, I pray that you'd make yourself known. Would you give them what they need? And I pray especially that you'd give them a great faith and a trust in you. Would you draw them close, lift her spirits too? Lord, she's been through a lot of physical problems, and she's still having trouble. And I just pray your mercy on her. Lord, would you give her joy in her spirit, the joy of her salvation? Lord, I pray for other people in this room right now who are struggling with things, with family matters, with finances, people who are dealing with sins, need your mercy. Lord, would you help us to see your goodness and your love? Lord, would you fill us with faith? Would you use the scripture to encourage us, build us up for your name's sake? Amen. All right, we are in Colossians 3 still. We've got this week and the next in Colossians 3. I want to encourage you to keep memorizing, to not forget, keep it up. Um, You don't have to be done the moment I'm done preaching it, but I just want to encourage you to keep going. This morning we're going to be looking at verses 20 through 21. This is about parents and kids. This is what it says, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. In 1887, there was a British man named John H. Starkey who was convicted on a murder charge. He had committed a string of other crimes under a bunch of different aliases earlier in his life. And when he married his wife, It was only a few weeks after the marriage that he started seeing another woman. And when his bride bride accused him of having an affair, he gruesomely murdered her and beheaded her. And he blamed the landlord. But her blood was found on his clothes and he was put to death. The officials asked General William Booth, who was the founder of the Salvation Army, to conduct Starkey's funeral. And an angry mob of people showed up at the funeral They didn't want this man to receive any honor or any burial rights because of the evil things that he had done. Surely, I think, some of that poor woman's family who was murdered were there in that crowd, I would guess. And when General Booth stood up in front of this riotous mob to give the eulogy, he began with these words. John Starkey never had a praying mother. That silenced the the crowd pretty well. Now, it's not that Starkey became a heartless, adulterous murderer because his mother didn't pray for him. He became that way because he was a sinner. Like the rest of us, he needed people in his life who would restrain him, who would guide him towards God, who would train him for godliness. And because he didn't have that, the natural path for him to take was toward a life of sin. See, despite their cuteness, Children are not born good. They're not innocent little lambs. We are not even a blank slate when we're born. Every human being comes into the world crooked, prone to evil, inclined toward foolishness, bent by their sinful nature. After his affair with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband Uriah, King David wrote this in Psalm 51, Surely, I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. We are responsible for the sins we commit. There's no question about that. But we are not responsible for our sinful nature. We were born that way. Everyone finds out that this theological doctrine is true by the time their their own children turn two years old. (laughs) How we need... God to enter our lives, to curb our sinfulness. If God did not impose himself into our lives to save us, we would all be traveling down the broad road that leads to destruction. And if not on the same path as John Starkey, 
than by one of the many side roads of greed and selfishness and vanity. There are some Christians, I'm sure some of you, were born to godless parents. Parents who actually led you into sin by their wicked example and by their behavior. But God saved you and brought you into his kingdom through a miraculous intervention. But most of the time, that's not how it works. That's not how it's supposed to work. God intervenes in our lives through human parents who guide us from, away from sin and train us for, godless, for godliness. Being born into this world is like a baby being set afloat on a dangerous river with a strong current. Just like a canoe speeds toward a raging waterfall when there's no one to steer it, the current of the world starts pushing a child toward destruction the moment he leaves the womb. Left to himself, a child would float with the flow of the world, doing what everybody else does, and proceeding unknowingly toward the terrible consequences of sin that will bring him eventually to spiritual disaster and death. Children do not have the wisdom to avoid the dangers of sin, and they don't have the strength for parents come in. A parent's role is to take their child along with them and paddle upstream toward God as hard as they can go. Going upstream means going against the world, according to his ways. If we're going to turn ourselves and turn our families away from worldliness and toward the kingdom. But the goal of parents and grandparents should not just be to keep their child from sin. Our goal is to bring them to God. Everyone's born with a sinful nature. As a parent, you can't keep your child from himself. At some point, the child's going to start making their own decisions, making their own choices. And parents who try to keep their kids away from sin, but don't bring them to a loving God, always do more harm than good. Going back to the river analogy, we could bring our child far upstream through family devotions, through taking them to church, watching to make sure they don't fall into sins that are going to entrap them. We could make sure that they fall in with just the right group of friends, that they get a good Christian education. But no matter how far upstream we take them, they're going to need to make their own choices. They're going to take their own boat at some point, sooner than we think. And if they don't take up their own paddle and start moving upstream to seek God for themselves, the current of the world is going to do all of your, undo all of your efforts. Many Christian parents mistake the goal. We think our job is done if we shelter them from sin while they're young. Our real job is to introduce them to Christ, who will guide them even when they're old. This is why we train up a child in the way they should go, as the proverb says. This is why we teach them to obey and to turn away from sin. It's so that they can know a holy God who loves them. Only God can cause a person to be born again, to become the new self that has died to sin and lives to righteousness. We can't change our kids. We can't change our grandkids. Only God can change a person. So is it even worth training our children for godliness? Is it good to make sure your kids are in church on every Sunday and on Wednesdays? Is it worth trying to teach them the Bible and family devotions? Should we bother guarding our children against the sins and the occasions of sin that other children fall into? Of course. A million times, yes, doing those things is so important. I'm so glad that my parents raised me how they did. I don't know if you know this, but I have a secret to tell you. Pastor's kids are born just as sinful as everybody else with all the same temptations that other people have and maybe a few more thrown in. Not only are we drawn to the same evil desires as others, we learn how to be hypocrites at a very early age. No one, not even pastor's kids, are born as Christians. 
But when by the grace of God, I was chosen, and I was forgiven, and I was read by Christ, I began to see what a blessing it was that my parents had removed obstacles of wickedness that would have, would have stood in my way. What a gift it was that they gave me, that they trained me in the way of the Lord by giving me the knowledge and the opportunities I needed to seek after him for myself. The rules that my parents gave me did not make me righteous. Rules can't make somebody righteous. But they were still necessary. Their rules, their expectations, their prayers for me, their wisdom, their values, their priorities, and most of all, their example gave me a vision for God and for his kingdom that set me on a path and just tell me to do to what to do to follow God. They did it themselves, and that made all the difference. That makes all the difference, parents and grandparents. When I came to love God for myself, and to be honest, I think I was probably in high school before that happened. I was, when, I, when I came to love him for myself, I was ready to run after him with all my heart. That's the work of a godly parent. Maybe you did not have those kind of parents growing up. But by the grace of God, you can be that kind of parent for your kids and for your grandkids. And if you don't have kids, you can be a spiritual mother or a spiritual father to those kids who don't have those kind of parents who are going to lead them and guide them. In order to do that, in order to be that kind of parent or grandparent or spiritual father or mother, you must seek God yourself with your whole heart. And as you do that, as, as a father or a mother or grandparent seeks God with all their heart, they make Christ so beautiful, so attractive, so wonderful in the eyes of their kids that the things of this world grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. In verse 20, Paul addresses the children first. He says, children... Obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. You know, even adults must obey the fifth commandment. Honor your father and mother. So honor to their parents by obeying them. Notice why, notice why parents are told to obey their parents. Obey, for this is pleasing to the Lord. This pleases the Lord. A kid's job is not to please their mom and dad. Kids' job is to please God. And that's good not only for kids to remember, but for parents as well. Thankfully, God is much easier to please than most parents are. A willing heart and a humble spirit is enough to fill God with joy. One of the signs that a child has truly been saved, that a child has become a Christian, is that they now desire to please God for themselves. They no longer obey their parents just to stay out of trouble or just to make them happy. They obey because that's what pleases their God. But since children naturally want to please their parents, it's a natural thing. Children want to make their parents proud. We parents need to be extra careful that what pleases us are the same things that please God. Kids quickly pick up on what makes their parents proud and impressed. If, a parent, if what pleases us the most is a good report card or sports achievements or a pretty face, our kids are going to run after those things with all they've got. Kids need to know that we would be prouder and happier if they loved God and lived for him than if they were famous athletes or successful businessmen or influential writers. Children need to learn to obey. Key word is learn. It's a process, and we parents must be patient to teach and to train them. Remember, they're sinners from birth. Obeying is not natural. We cannot expect obedience if we don't show them how. 
Children are to obey their parents in everything, Paul says. This is not occasional obedience, but continual. This obedience should be from the heart, not for eye service. This obedience should come from love and respect, not from compliance, not from fear. That means that parents need to make themselves worthy of respect and love. Since children are given this command before they can even read it, parents should realize that it's our responsibility to see to it that our children obey us in everything. Remember that children are born both as children and as sinners. I've found that many times my impatience, my frustration with my kids is due not to their rebelliousness, but to the fact that I haven't carefully and lovingly taken their nature into account. I figure they should be acting like adults. <laughs> While the expectation must be that they obey us in everything, that should be the expectation. And discipline must be used when they don't. We always need to be gentle and patient with them as we possibly can. One of the things that we parents and grandparents must keep in mind is that while our children may have been born to us, they don't belong to us. They belong to God. He has loaned these kids to us to raise them for him, for his service. In other words, we're raising God's kids, not our own. They must grow to become like Christ, not like mini-me's. The reason why children must learn to obey us is so that they can learn to obey God. Kids aren't going to understand that at first. But when they learn to obey us in everything, they're going to have a much better time in obeying God in everything. That's why it's so important that they learn how to obey us, obey their parents. They do not need to obey for our sake, to make our lives more convenient or less stressful. We demand obedience to God's will, not to our own whims. We're not forcing our kids to do what we want them to do, but helping them and training them to do what God wants them to do. We're teaching them to obey a God who loves them, a God who's patient with them, a God who's quick to forgive them. And that means we need to love them and be patient with them and forgive them too. When we realize and accept these are God's kids, these are God's grandkids, not ours, our attitude towards them are gonna, is going to change. Would we yell at the sons and daughters of God? Would we ignore them or let them fall into sin? I've noticed, just being honest, that I can sometimes be friendlier and gentler with other people's kids than I am with my own. And if I only realize that my kids belong to someone else, I would certainly change how I treat them. They belong to God. Built into the process of child rearing should be the idea that there is a God over this family. He's the God that both the children and the parents are to love and obey. Constant attention should be drawn to God in the home whether by reading the Bible together, family prayers, or drawing the dinner conversation to God. I found that children, little kids, are naturally curious about God. It's built right into them. And if we are interested in God ourselves, it's not going to take, take much effort at all for them to be interested in God too. Yeah, kids are prone to sin, but children are almost always incredibly open to God when they're small. If, if the parents set the tone that we worship Jesus in this household, we honor him, we do what he says, half the battle is already won. Of course, that takes constant reinforcement. And we must follow through on our discipline with our children and when they do things or say things that are not pleasing to God. I've met many teenagers who have rules from their parents, but they don't understand why their parents made those rules. That leads to rebellion. 
It must be made abundantly clear to everyone in the house that this family has a Lord, and we do what we do, and we don't do what we do because of him. As parents, it's our responsibility to discipline our kids when they're disobedient. We need to remember to discipline them lovingly for the sake of love. That's where verse 21 comes in. Paul says, fathers, do not embitter your children or they'll become discouraged. While children are told to obey parents, both the mother and the father, Paul addresses fathers specifically here. Paul was writing to a culture that was dominated by the husband and by the father. Children were legally regarded as the father's property. They were basically slaves to the fathers. And most fathers treated their kids like slaves. Paul did not try to take away the father's authority over his children. But he did remind them to use their authority for the good of their kids, which is the exact opposite of slavery. God did not give them children for their own honor, for their own enjoyment, but to raise them up for God. Dads, we must take the responsibility of raising our kids for Christ. Not leave it to others. Our work as fathers trumps our hobbies, trumps our careers, even trumps our roles at church. We are to manage our families well so that through us, the loving, good, and holy God can rule our home. Now, it's true that we need to discipline our kids and we need to refrain from giving them things that they're going to want because we know it'd be bad for them. But we need to be careful that we discipline with self-control and not make it too difficult for them to follow our instructions. I know from experience how hard that, how hard that is. But we can't expect our children to have self-control if we don't have self-control when we talk to them. Just because children need to obey us in everything doesn't give us the right to make unrealistic or unreasonable demands of our kids. If we're not careful, our children will become hardened. They'll become discouraged. This is what I think Paul means when he says, don't embitter your children. The word embitter is, is a, a Greek word that means to kind of stir up. We stir them up. We stir our kids up when we make harsh demands and strict punishments. And then we discourage them when we show them a lack of grace and patience when they fail. Some parents do a great job at teaching their kids the fear of the Lord. But they forget to preach the gospel to their own children. The child should be introduced to the gospel by their parents. First, by their example of how they forgive their kids and have patience and mercy when they fail over and over again, which they will. And then by sharing with their kids that Jesus died on the cross to forgive their sins because he loves them. You can't nag, you can't beat sin out of a kid. <laughs> Spank, sin out of a kid. But by displaying the gospel in both example and in words, you can draw them closer to a loving God. We are all bent. We've all been broken by sin. But when a parent can look at their, their broken child and they can say, I forgive you and I love you even more than I ever have, that, should, that, that will teach them, that'll show them the love of God, the way God is, and the power of the cross. Children should learn not just by words, but by experience. They should learn the gospel from how their parents treat them. I see the gospel in these two verses. Jesus is the Lord. We must be careful to obey him in everything. That's a big part of the gospel. But Jesus is also good. He's forgiving. He's ready to restore us the moment we turn from our sin. He sacrificed himself on the cross for us. Our families, our homes, should be a place where the truth of the gospel is constantly being reinforced, constantly being rehearsed. 
Parents sacrificing themselves for their kids, bearing with their failures, with patience, like Christ did, with great patience, with great love. Children obeying their parents in everything with respect, and everyone in the family seeking after the God who is the Father of all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us, for giving us human parents, even the ones who didn't do a very good job. Lord, you have guided us to yourself, shown us so much patience and love and forgiveness on the cross. Lord, we were born bent, and yet you've loved us and restored us. Would you help us to be good parents and good grandparents to our kids? Would you help us to be good spiritual fathers and mothers to the kids in this church? Lord, would you help us to take responsibility to raise the kids that you've put here up for you, your kids? Lord, would you help us to see them that way, as precious, as gifts? And Lord, would you make in our church a family and a home where children become godly, godly parents to their own kids. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together to sing Good, Good Father. Say, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night. Our God is tender. He is good to us. He's a good father. Let's sing that together.
A few things. Don't forget we have prayer helpers up here if you have a prayer need. If you want to pray for your, parent, uh, your, your parents or kids or grandkids and want someone to pray for them, come on up and speak to them or anything else that's going on in your life. Remember to sign up for the Good Deeds auction. It doesn't have to be anything big, but it's, it's really just about being together and having a, a fun time, but also having a, a family time together as a church. So if you're able, sign up for that. And then remember to stay for Sunday school at 10 o'clock in this room if you're able as well. The Schaefers are going to be sharing, and uh, we can get to, to know them more. Um, and just they're a part of us too, and so being able to stay uh, here and hear from them would be great if you're able. Now, let me pray for you, and I'm going to pray this prayer from the book of Ephesians that Paul prays for them. I'm going to pray it for us. Let's pray. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power, that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout 